My name is Niklas Eriksson, and I'm a researcher and, and archaeologist at the Swedish, uh, no, uh, not at Swedish, at um, Södertörn University. Uh, <coughs> and uh, I'm, my main focus of research has been uh, quite later ships, mainly 17th century ships. Um, and I'm, uh, for the moment, I'm writing a book about the introduction of English shipbuilding in Sweden during the 17th century. But as Gripshunden is such an interesting ship, um, such an interesting wreck, I, I can't stay away from this wreck also. So, um, uh, so I've, as you once mentioned, I'm, I've been involved in this project since uh, 2013, when we began diving there again, so to say. Uh, the focus of, of uh, this presentation is, as you can see, the ship archaeological analysis. But, uh, I, I have divided this into two, uh, two different topics. And uh, the first one is quite a silly question, uh, because why is Gripsunden interesting? And I think that uh, all of us that are here today are have, um, think that this Gripsunden is interesting in, in different ways, of course, because there's a multiple of aspects that you can discuss with this um, uh, wreck as a point of departure. But I, I think I should mention some, some of it from a, a naval architectural uh, point of view. And I also want to uh, uh, present some of the results from the field work in uh, 2013, uh, focusing on the site formation, why the wreck looks like it, like it does today, and uh, also the, the naval architecture. But when we are discussing why Gripsunden is important or interesting, I think it's important to start somewhere here. Um, with, the, with the transition from medieval to modern. And uh, if you ask an historian or an archaeologist what was the transition from medieval to modern, they will, they will come with several different answers, of course. <clears throat> One could argue that it was uh, the formation of nation states. Uh, and it was the, in, in Northern Europe is uh, the, um, the transition from uh, Catholicism to Protestantism and the, the more powerful kings and so forth. This transition from medieval to more modern actually materializes itself in, in different ways. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the structures of power is, uh, is, is very evident in, in this sense. During the transition from a medieval to a modern society, castles became palaces. And uh, this also involved a lot of, of technical improvements within artillery and, and, and so on, and, uh, and ideology. So that uh, we, we, just as the castles get uh, the, around the, the gun turrets or the, the towers with, with uh, cannons, Ships went through a, a similar uh, um, uh, development. But as, as we can see, castles can be around for 800 years or so. Ships are around for 30 years. So we have much less uh, information about the ships from, from this period and, and what the ships look like. This is also a period where, where you have a, an, um, a more uh, more established administration within the states. And a, a more established administration means that you can have put away money and, uh, and uh, people that you can use as, as a navy. Um, and that's really the big difference with, with the state formation. Whereas the medieval navy was, was a bunch of, of ships that you gathered for, uh, for a specific event, for a, for a threat or a small war, uh, the modern navy was uh, more of an institution. So the development from medieval to modern was also the formation of the navy from event to an institution. And why is Gripsunden interesting in this aspect? It's because Gripsunden is, you can place Gripsunden right in between the medieval and the modern wrecks, warships. Uh, the medieval ships 
such as, for instance, the COGS. There were a lot of other ships also. As, um, they were used as trading vessels, and in, uh, during an uh, event of war, they were armed with a, with a number of guns and uh, used for, for warfare. And when the war was over, they, they could be used as, uh, as trading vessels again. These ships were, were only uh, were, were specialized warships. And Gripsunen is one of the first of those. <coughs> we can, when, when uh, we b began to work with, with uh, Gripsunden, the, this picture popped up in both my head and, and I think you once had also. Because uh, one could argue that uh, Gripsunen looked something like this. It's, a, it's a, an, an, um, an engraving from around 1470, I think, uh, by uh, a master that we don't know the name of, but we call him W.A. And it's a Kräk, it's a, it's a Karak ship. And it, and, uh, it reveals some, some uh, different characteristics. Uh, most notably, it's, um, it has a carver built hull, which is, uh, which is something new in, in, uh, in Northern Europe during this period. It has high fore and stern castles. Uh, the reason that they had this high fore and stern castle is that, the, that medieval naval warfare was land battles that had gone to sea, so to say, that they were fighting each other with, uh, with pikes and swords and uh, uh, crossbows and so, so on. So to ha have a high ship was a ta of tactical importance. So when you, you sailed up to the enemy and you could throw things down onto the enemy's ship. As you also can see here, in, in the mast you have these uh, fighting tops. And you can see that is things sticking up from, uh, from these fighting tops. Um, it's spars that they could throw down on the enemies. And they also had these boarding nets so that uh, to avoid getting that, that nasty stuff on, onto the deck, so to say. So it's um, very much a, a war that you throw things on each other. But you also have, if you look carefully at, at this engraving, you also have a number of guns that are placed here along the so-called gun whale. I will get back to this detail uh, later on because we have the gun whale from, from Gripsunda. So we have guns placed here but also one up here. Um, and it's quite an interesting detail here. We have an, an elevator that you can uh, take things up to the, to the fighting top. There's also a boarding hook that you can throw and, and uh, grab, uh, grab the enemy's ship. So it's one of those ships that we have on the seabed here, outside the Ekön. So it's, the, the Gripsunen could of course be used as an uh, illustration and a, a way to, to look at King Hans and, and uh, Kalmar Union and, and so on. But it's also a re, uh, one of the few that remain of a very characteristic uh, type of ship that existed for a very short time uh, in history. Um, yes. This is the site, it's Stora Ekön, it's a round island placed here. And King Hans and his fleet were anchored inside Ekön. Uh, it's uh, among the few good places to anchor, uh, still today actually. And uh, always when we have been there, it's been a lot of, of recreational boats in the area. And you can see it also when you're diving at the site that there's a lot of trash and uh, um, rubbish all over it. So uh, people have been throwing this, throwing litter on, on this ship for, uh, for 500 years or so. This little red dot here is, is the wreck. It's resting at uh, 7 to uh, 10 meters or so. With the bow pointing towards the island. During the, the field work has been of a non-intrusive uh, character. It, that's, that's what's so fantastic with the Baltic Sea shipwrecks, that we can 
actually survey them and you can do a lot of archaeology without digging or raising artifacts. Just through recording what's on the surface you can get, get quite good information. You can write a lot of articles and books just from the, the ship timbers that you see when diving. And uh, we used, uh, we have cooperated with Marine Math Technique MMT, who has uh, made this multi-beam scan of the site, which is, which provides a very good uh, uh, first view of the site, as you can see. But uh, to look at the details, you have to go down there yourself. And we have used film, small GoPro cameras, and uh, we have made some sketches and taken measurements. That's that's how we have worked. And the result is, uh, is a preliminary plan of the site, so that we know what, what the wreck consists of and what le was left at the seabed. We also done uh, some uh, experiments with uh, um, um, something, something wrong here. Okay. Um, with uh, um, photogrammetry, and we will uh, continue that because it's uh, it's very it's developing very very fast, and, and we think that it's it's a good place to, to do that. But it's quite uh, difficult to, to, to do photogrammetry at just at, the, at this uh, site because there's so much seaweed and uh, uh, stuff in the in the water. As we can see here, the I marked the keel here with the red line. So the keel is uh, in the middle, and we have the bow pointing to left, and, uh, and the stern pointing to the right. And I should have uh, something to, to, is it? Ah, this one is a little bit longer. <laughs> this is, uh, um, um, Relingen, the gun whale, the, the place for the gun, the actual gun whale is placed here, but this is, is the hull is preserved up to, to uh, entirely preserved, but it's uh, collapsed into two halves. The stem is placed here, it's a very long and curved timber, yeah. remember the, the high four castle of, of, of these ships, so it's a very long stem, it's slightly curved like that. It's resting uh, flat at the seabed with a, with a rabbit line for, for the planking. Uh, we have this stern post here with uh, some of the, the uh, floor timbers preserved also. The written sources about Gripsunden, that concern Gripsunden, mention the ship as a kravel, uh, which means that it's corvel built. Um, I, I will take this very basically as, as I don't know how much, you're, how much you are ship nerds, but uh, clinker construction was, was, was the most common from the Viking period and, and onwards and still is quite common in uh, traditional wooden shipbuilding, or boat building, as when the, where the hull planks overlap each other. But during the, during the transition from medieval to modern, uh, corval construction was introduced uh, also in, uh, in, uh, in Scandinavia and around the Baltic. And uh, Gripsunen is actually totally built with the uh, corval planking and is, is the oldest one that we have found in the Baltic Sea. So it's uh, entirely corval built, which is quite unique. There is a tradition that the first corval built ship was built in Gdansk in 1460. Um, we don't know if it's true, of course, that it, it was uh, actually the case, but it shows that the existence of the tradition shows that this, during the late 15th century, corval construction was quite unique in, in the Baltic Sea area. We also found the ship's rudder. It's resting on its side, like that, and it's um, um, six and a half meters long, so it's 
Together with the stem and the stern post, it uh, offers quite good, uh, good opportunities to uh, reconstruct the, the shear, uh, the, the, what the ship looked like from, uh, from the side. This, this is quite interesting, I think. This, this is the top of the rudder. It's uh, slightly curved like that. And it's, uh, we can see it on, on different sketches and paintings from, from the 15th and 16th century. Uh, it looks like it is to, to uh, adjust to the, to the counter of, of the ship's stern. So we think that uh, Gripsunnen had this similar counter on, on, on the stern. A lot of the deck of this ship uh, is still preserved at the site. So it's, it's, when the sides of the hull collapsed like that, uh, the, hull, uh, the, the deck just went down, straight down. So these uh, red lines here uh, shows the, the, the deck beams. So it's through uh, measuring the de deck beams and also the notches and, and all the stuff, all the details in, in the, these deck beams, it's, it is possible to reconstruct the deck of Gripsunder. Uh, this one is a deck beam as well, actually. Hey. So we can, we can reconstruct the, the shape of the deck, but we can also reconstruct where the, the, le the level of the deck, uh, the different deck levels. Because there is a, uh, what, what's called a shelf clamp, uh, a, a thick timber onto which the deck beams rested. It's preserved uh, here. This, this is the same tip, timber seen from above. Yeah. Compared to, to later constructions, it's quite thick and it's placed on the, on the inside of the inner planking, which is quite odd. Yeah. There's a lo lot of oddities in, in this. Uh, Wreck, which makes it very interesting. Balkvägar, yeah. Um, the, the shelf clamp, the balkvägar, is preserved all the way, appears to be preserved all the way to here. Um, so it's the, it was placed here on, on, on the ship. Um, with, uh, there's a shelf clamp balkvägar on, on this side as well. And here, in, in the bow, we actually have a, a preserved deck structure, deck, preserved deck planks uh, underneath the, the sediments. So it's, it's actually very well preserved here. So the, the, the area underneath the forecastle uh, is, is preserved. We also have what, what is called a bit beam, as a beating bulk in Swedish. Uh, a thick beam that was placed in, in the bow of the ship, uh, used uh, to, to tie the anchor cable around it. It's placed loose here. It's a very massive timber. We have also have these uh, characteristic horse um, timbers. Um, that was placed on, on the inside of the, of the planking to uh, strengthen the the, the, the hull around the, the, the anchor cable, the hole for the anchor cable. There are several different versions of, of these medieval uh, horse holes, but uh, well it, was, it looked something like that. You can also see that the clinker built upper part of this Mataro model uh, is similar to, to what we see on, on, on the horse timber. So the stem of Gripsunde was placed here, uh, and, um, and, and, and this timber was placed on, on the side. So it's a mirrored, mirrored, mirrored version of, of that timber also. Well, we haven't seen it. Yeah. Gripsunde had a high fore and stern castle, um, just like this Mataro model again. Yeah. Actually, I stretched it a bit because it's, it's, it's so chubby, this, uh, this model. Like this. And actually, most of the, the component parts of this forecastle appears to be uh, still preserved in, in the soil at, at the seabed. 
Like for instance, this timber, uh, this one, is placed here. And this timber is actually uh, the one with this um, uh, cute monster uh, on, on its end. Just to, to be a bit pedagogic here, so it was placed on top of the stem like that, and it probably is, is broken where, where the stem would have ended. And you can see there's a small notch here, this one. Um, in this timber, there was a, a stanchion standing like that, and then this was a an entire forecastle built around it. So it's quite an important part of the, of the ship that uh, was raised. You can see there's, there's a small uh, monster on, on this uh, drawing as well. I brought this one just to show that if we, have, if we are lucky, we can actually find another uh, monster. Now this is a... Uh, a big ship painted in, in uh, Gdansk. Because there was a, a version of, of this forecastle that were square uh, instead of triangular, that was, they were square, so they were flat in, in, the, in the end. So if Gripsund Grips had, had such a stern uh, forecastle, uh, there is another one down there. Gripsund also had a stern castle, and most of uh, the stern castle structure is preserved down in the, in the soil as well. Um, you can see on, on this, uh, this is uh, actually a tapestry. Um, we have the, the carvel built hull up to here, and we have the gunwale, and we see the, 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 the cannons are, are pointing like this in different directions because they are, uh, are uh, placed in, um, in uh, what you call mica, like that. And uh, it's... Swivel guns. Swivel guns, yes, <laughs> thanks. And the guns that were raised uh, from Gripsund were of, of this type. I will show you a picture soon. And this is important because this is, um, is as, as I mentioned initially, it's, uh, this is a period where there was field battles that had gone to sea. The people were fighting each other man to man, but they were also beginning to use uh, firearms. And there were, and the uh, Lasse and Kalmar County Museum, um, uh, during their survey, they uh, salvaged uh, some of the guns. Um, and they are all of this uh, wrought iron type with the, with the breech loaded, with the breech loaded like here. Um, this replica was actually made by Blekinge Museum. I don't know where it, where it is right now, but... It's in the magazine. Okay. The storage. So it's on the small exhibition. Okay. And so the distribution of the guns is, is quite important to, to um, take notice of. So I, I, uh, I, I would like to discuss it later on, the distribution, how we can fit them into the plan. Yeah. Maybe we have time later on to, to discuss that. Because uh, that's really the, the interesting part. Often we say that, that the introduction of carvel shipbuilding in uh, Northern Europe was uh, due to, to, the, uh, to the, the requirement that they wanted to uh, take up gun ports in the hull side. However, I don't think that uh, Gibson had any gun ports along the carver built part of the hull. Um, rather, it, uh, the, the gun ports were placed in, in the clinker built uh, upper part. And, um, and the guns themselves were placed along the gunwale. This timber. I were placed, this one was placed in between the forecastle and the stern castle, so it was placed here and they had uh, the swivel guns placed in, in this beam. Actually, it's the same that we see here. I think that Gibson was more of this uh, character. There are, 
when Gripsunen sank, most of the rig was probably sticking up over the water surface. But there are traces of, of the rig um, that we can see. A ship of this size would have had uh, three masts. Uh, one very huge main mast placed in, in the middle of the ship with a, with a gigantic sail. And also uh, uh, a smaller four mast, as we see here, and, and a mizzen mast in the stern. We have uh, remains of the mast steps for the four mast placed here. It was stepped in, in the deck structure that, that are preserved here in, in this area. Uh, and we also have a, a mizzen mast step uh, in, in the stern as well. But also in the deck structure, or are you actually on the keel? Uh, that, that one is, lying, uh, is loose. Um, the mizzen mast is stepped in the deck structure, or in the...? In, in the deck structure. In the deck structure. Yeah. So it's um, as on Dutch ships during the 17th century and, and so on. But the foremast was also placed. You, you can almost see it on, on, on this... Uh, picture that it was placed very high up in, in, the, in, the, in the hull structure. Um, the capstan, one capstan was salvaged uh, during Kalmar County's um, uh, museum's um, uh, surveys. And we actually found um, the, the um, lagringen, the um, the bracket for, 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 the, for another capstan um, during our survey. So, the future. Uh, we could, of course, I, I, think, I think that the, the, the forecastle structure, this, we are, as we have begun to raise the, the as we have raised the monster, the, the beam with the monster, and we also have this very well preserved forecastle structure, which is very unique and uh, yeah, well preserved. My suggestion is that, that we continue to focus on, on the forecastle to, to learn more and uh, to, uh, to, um, to uh, reconstruct the, the, the surroundings of, of, the, of the monster, not, not the least. So, um, we can do that. And we should also try to clean the hull structure, clean the site from uh, seaweed and, uh, and um, sediments and, and so on, so that we can see what's, what's left. That doesn't mean that we go into cultural layers, but remove some of the sediments and some of the seaweed so we can see what's, what's still there. That would be great. And to make a good... Uh, and, and then when, when we have cleaned the site, that we go and go for, forward and uh, make a good um, um, 3D photogrammetry of, of the site so that we know what the, the wreck looked like. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Niklas. Uh, Niklas said that they have, they have just done this between other things he said, but uh, I know that Niklas has spent quite a lot of work in, uh, on this. So, so <laughs> and, um, but uh, I, think, I think it's quite amazing how much information there is out there, and, and uh, we have just started really. Mm. So, so uh, if one wants to, to see uh, how a ship like this was built from this period, and not checking the material model, we can actually check it out here. Yeah. <laughs> because a lot of ship archaeologists, they looked at this material model and they would not want to know how it was actually built. And here is the real material model on the, on the sea bottom. Um, I think we, let's have a small discussion now. I'm quite sure there are a lot of questions to, 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 to Niklas. And, and then, yes. Yeah, Peters, thank you very much. It's extremely interesting. You were talking about what to do in the future. Yeah. Uh, from my point of view, I would be very interesting to for you to go down and, and actually examine the hall itself. Yeah. For for looking at traces of uh, you know the North uh, Dutch filling method, the, or or skeleton first or frame first. Uh, that would be extremely interesting from my point of view. 
to you know about that. Also, the fasting of the planks and everything. Mm -hmm. So, I think you could go there. Okay. <laughs> but there are se several different ways to, to do that, I think. We should have a, a clean plan. This one is quite key. Because if, if we want to have a lot of artifacts, we should dig this side here. Because when, when the ship sank, it, it tilted over to the starboard side. But if we want to study the ship contracture, we can dig this side here. If we don't want to have a lot of conservation and, and so on. And I think that the, the, yeah. the, the, the questions that, that you ask, they are very, very, of course very important. And I'm, I'm very interested in that also. Uh, I think that we can answer them, get a glimpse of it through serving here. So it's, it's depending on the amount of money that we want to spend on, on such a survey. That, why, I, why I was so interested in, in the forecast, at least that because we began to, to raise the, 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 the monster. Yeah, but of course, also, this is probably yeah. the first time we see a forecastle. Yeah. So, of course, this is new, new. Yeah, yeah. And, and the other one is more, what should we say, more technical. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not about uh, technical transfer, transference, really, about how it was built, the one or the other method. Yeah. Because where did it come from? Mm. Whereas uh, that one is uh, much more maybe seen into a naval military uh, sense of, you know, how did they do combat at the time? Mm, yeah, but both are very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's very important at this stage to, to really emphasize that even the ship archaeological survey or documentation is is an act of is an activity in the war in in the realm. We often talk about the uh, recovering artifacts for yeah. the conservation problem, but just doing the work that you do is actually uh, a very active uh, thing done to the wreck. Yeah, uncover things, measure. I guess these uh, these discoveries that you have made is not just uh, something you have done without touching the wreck. You must touch the wreck in order to see the features of it, right, Nicholas? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yes. So what I want to point out is that even if you don't bring up a lot of artifacts, the, the, the wreck will be definitely affected by future uh, activities on the wreck. Definitely. Because I. I don't want to, to, to charge you with this. I just wanted to, to focus on what the purpose of this uh, seminar is. It's actually the future of the ship and what will happen to the ship on site and what will happen on the artifacts if, if we are to go out for conservation and so on. Yeah. I hope you understand my point. That yeah. it's, uh, whatever is done to this wreck, even though if it's left where it is, uh, and it's a sleeping beauty position, it will still be a, a lot of discussion and thinking about how to to sort of control the activity model. Yeah, I, I totally agree. But um, I, I've seen it on, on every site that I've been working with, that when you're swimming around, and even if there are good divers that will swim with the, with the foot up, up, up to the surface and, and so on, there are, the site is uh, damaged or sea, seaweed and sediments are moved. But the problem, I think, is that uh, it's, it's, it's impossible to do, as, as, just as you say, it's impossible to do archaeology without affecting the wreck in one way or, or the other. Um, the, the, what I think is um, uh, important is that <coughs> it's, it's much better to know, know th something about the wreck than, than nothing. And, and I, I, I think that. It's an expression in Sweden. <laughs> but you're an amulet must make naked or I don't want to say. Well, um, you, ha you have to, uh, we have to do that. Of course, for all our it's a, it's a process of destruction. Yeah, but it's, this one is not but so. What I'm saying is that I'm not sort of disputing the fact that there have been uh, interferences in the way you know, yet. But, from it. But, but what I'm saying is it's something that you have to take in mind. Yeah. When you look at whatever you do with the wreck in the future, you have to really bear in mind that whatever you do, it will definitely affect the wrecking one way or another. Yeah. So that's the point. yeah, but the point is also that, that you have to record what you're doing. And, and that, that's, that's the really important point. And, um, uh, and, and this site was, this is actually the, the, the first plan that has been made at this site. And uh, with, with any detail. And 
we can see every dive that we have done here, there's a lot of trash and uh, stuff in, in the wreck. Because there are a lot of recreational divers, uh, recreational boats there all the time that are throwing stuff on, onto the, to the wreck site. And they are doing more damage than we are doing, actually. But, but the difference is that we, we make, uh, make research of it. Yep. Uh, I agree very much with, uh, with uh, what was said there regarding that archaeology uh, is, is intrusive, yeah. even if you're doing it uh, very, very carefully. But I do see the importance of doing some research on this very, very fascinating way. But I think whatever you do, whatever program you start, that it's important to build into that program a sort of protection part yeah. after the research, when you can cover, uh, because I mean, see, it's very difficult to get, get it back again once you removed it. So also work on, on a program for in situ preservation of the ship, maybe a monitoring program to see uh, what, is, what is the degree of degradation, what is happening with the layers, so that you are, have a survey of the ship. Mm. But that the wreck site is protected, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Yes. yes. There shouldn't be any. Uh, it's a restricted area, so yeah. you don't. Um, if you want to go down to the wreck site, you have to go to the county administrative board. Yeah. But but still, yeah. but still also, uh, I know that for example, there have been traces of shipworm in one home, and you don't know for how long. I mean, with the, with the temperatures and the seas rising and so forth coming in. You're not out of, totally out of risk anymore. No. So as soon as you start removing what is covering and protecting the ship, you're also opening for 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 the uh, biological uh, yeah, yeah. Just a, a small. It's a very important point. <laughs> yeah. If the ship warm come tomorrow and it away with the ship, mm. this is what will remain. The the recording. And I think that that's an important aspect of it, that we, we have a good recording of what is there right now. Yes. And, and, and to do that, we have to remove the seaweed, because otherwise we will, won't see it. Yes. So I, I think that... Um, yeah. But that's what I say, if you do that, you need to take some sort of action to, yeah. to, to, uh, to protect afterwards. I mean, yeah. But, but I, I'm sure we'll just continue to discuss this <laughs> later on. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm just uh, wondering, uh, what about anchoring in the area? There's a lot of anchoring in there. So also actually anchoring in the in the wreck, in the wreck time. <coughs> I think it's forbidden also. Yeah, we we have a, made a restricted area yeah. um, on sea maps, mm -hmm. well, uh, and uh, we also um, have a discussion about putting up uh, boys or something yeah. or really restricting oh, yeah. the area physically and with signs and. Uh, it's not in place yet, but it's an ongoing discussion. Yeah, because on the other hand, hand you'll actually mark the, the site. Yeah. So. Yes, but it's already known. So. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, more eyes, the better. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Oh, well. You, you can't make an om omelette without smashing the eggs, Nicholas said. So, so, um, so, I mean, this is the basic question if you think that if the omelette is worth it. I mean, do we think this omelette is worth smashing some eggs? So, so uh, I find that that's the most important question, really, to, to, to answer. Okay. Just, uh, I just want to refer to your question there. Why do we think the wreck is in where it is? It's a perfect place for anchoring. And it's mentioned in the archival sources all along. Mm. In Peter Jebda, in the 6th and 7th mentioned that this is a, a, a very, very good way to anchor, place anchor. But I will also like to say that there are four moorings with GPS positions around the wrecks which could be used for mooring and when you, when, which is put down when we did the first survey. Mm -hmm. So they might may be used in order to avoid. Yeah, <coughs> the, the project have used them. Yeah, we have used them. We, we have used them, but the recreational boats don't use them. <laughs> no, but that's another question. Yeah. Because I, we have the same situation with the crew now. The, the important part, even though it seems like bureaucracy and red tape or whatever, that is who really have the formal right to avoid interference with the right. Now that's a second question, how we sort of uh, enforce that, that, that uh, bureaucratic rule that uh, there is possibility. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. Yeah, just uh, just to pick, pick that up and put a scare into everybody comparing to the Danneborg break in Denmark from uh, 1720. Uh, that is a known position and that has been extensively uh, robbed. So this is a potential danger, really. If this comes out really big, you should almost have 24-hour eyes on the site because, I mean, Danneborg has been very much ruined by divers, uh, sports divers, in the last 20 years or something like that. So that is a danger. I, I don't want to challenge what you're saying about the, the, the risks when you take sediments and see where they are away, but just look, just look at this site. This is the floor timbers sticking up two meters from the sea bottom. Uh, they are still staying there today and been, and have been up two meters above the bottom for 500 years. And they are exactly, extremely well preserved. They have never been covered by sediments or something. They have been open for shipworm for 600 years. So, uh, just to mention that in the discussion. 